Hello, Bill Molyneux here with Fast Play War Games, and I am at Conrad Weiser's homestead with Dennis McKibben, the great Native American historian, and I'm going to turn it over to Dennis. Uh, take it away, Dennis. <laughs> nice introduction, Bill. I don't know how great a historian I am, but I am a Native reenactor, and I'm here this weekend at the Conrad Weiser house with my display of European trade goods for Native gifts and diplomacy. Uh, I've got an entire uh, half the room here all to myself, and uh, Bill has some photos and video of the different items that I have to display here this weekend. Um, starting out with uh, shirts and blankets and bolts of cloth of uh, many different descriptions. Uh, shoes but with and without buckles, stockings. Um, now I have a question for you. Yes, sir. Um, can you explain would, why would you have shoes for Native American Indians? Well, Native Americans actually traded uh, for shoes over time, um, especially along the East Coast. Not all of them gave up the moccasins right away, but uh, some of them preferred the harder shoes. And if they decided they wanted those, then they were available at certain trading posts and as uh, gifts for different diplomatic uh, events going on, such as treaties and such, or, or gifts uh, from the different politicians or the provincial government of Pennsylvania to different tribes that they wanted to interact with. Um, you get down the line here, you'll see a number of beads. Uh, up front, you'll see all those white beads, and that's simply because white beads were the predominant uh, bead being found in archaeological uh, excavations uh, these days. So in order to represent those adequately, I laid up quite a few of those. And you'll see there, there's quite a bit of uh, material here and not just one or two of each item. And what I'm trying to do with that is trying to project not only the different variety of items, but the vast quantity of, that were used during this time period. Well, I have a couple more questions for you, Dennis. Why would you have all these pots? I mean, why you're trading muskets and natives. I'm sure a lot of people who don't know about the French Indian War would think you'd only be trading muskets or tomahawks well you're trading with the native culture not just with the men okay so when you're trading with the entire culture you're trading the villages you're also trading with the women the women have a lot more use for the pots than they did for the muskets uh, the pots we all know that there were quite a few uh, native pots and pottery being made by the native americans but when they were able to get hold of these uh, they suffered a lot less breakage, and um, they were easier to transport and move around for the, for the Native women. Uh, my understanding is initially they didn't really like the pots too much because it changed the uh, flavor of the food, but over you know many years they got used to that sort of thing. And uh, the number of uh, trade goods we have on display here is just a small portion of what would have been actually uh, traded or presented as gifts at any one time. What you see here might have been the uh, catch of a single trader at, a, at a, any, um, you know, going up back river. However, people like Conrad Weiser, who were at his homestead here this weekend, when they did uh, diplomatic gifts with the natives prior to the treaties, they would encompass entire Conestoga wagons full of these goods. Not just one, but probably a dozen to two dozen wagons, which were the um, trucking of the 18th century, full of native trade goods, or full of the European trade goods that you see here. Now, like wow. I said, this is just a small representation of what well, would have been available. I have a couple more questions I'm sure I'd have to answer if I don't ask them now. Um, what are these bells, and what are these plates, and finally, <laughs> can you tell me why do you have Chinese something or other there? Is that tea? So That is not tea, okay? These are tinklers, okay, the different bells that were used for different dance items or for uh, the women to actually, they would actually uh, wear bells on their moccasins through the village. Uh, those and the uh, brass thimbles here that were made of little tinklers, and the reason for that was that they would uh, be trying to attract the attention of the men. 
they walked through the village and their their little tinklers were gone and everybody turned around and looked at them. It was kind of a um, uh, what a, a fashion statement for them. Wow. Um, these are gorgets, okay, without the insignias, without the French or the British insignias, but the gorgets are actually left over from um, the medieval times. It was uh, originally part of a suit of armor that were worn by the knights. Now, that evolved into insignias of rank among the military for both the French and the uh, English, and the Native Americans would see this and see that this was uh, worn by distinguished people among the, uh, the military on both sides, and so they wanted similar items themselves. So, of course, being a trader, you would make that available to them, um, minus the insignia, of course, because the Natives weren't most times in the military, but they, uh, if you did it without the insignia, then you could trade it with uh, Natives uh, either allied to the English or the French uh, without uh, worrying about which side the native was on at that time. Uh, the items in the um, Chinese boxes are actually vermilion, okay? Now this is modeled after a display in the Wisconsin uh, um, Museum, State Museum, and they have a display of the way the uh, vermilion was packaged and sold to the Native Americans, which was in these small packets like this right here, and that's pretty much what it would look like. And what was this, this product used for, Dennis? Uh, the vermilion was a powdered, um, it was like a pigment that was used by the Native Americans for face painting. Um, Native Americans would paint for just about any occasion. Okay, it wasn't just for going to war. They would paint to visit friends, they would paint to socialize, they would paint for ceremony, they would paint for dances. Anytime you wanted to uh, make an impression with somebody, you would paint up to look your best. And the vermilion was one of the pigments that was traded to the Native Americans through the English and the French both and uh, made available to them for that purpose. Now, what people don't realize is that vermilion um, goes by another name, uh, mercury sulfide, I believe it is, which is actually uh, mercury ore, powdered mercury. Well, wouldn't that be poisonous? It is poisonous, okay? Uh, back in the um, mid-18th century, people did not know about heavy metal poisoning. They had no idea it was toxic, and so the... Uh, paint that was being sold to the Native Americans was poisoning them and if you know anything about mercury poisoning it doesn't just uh, one generation it, it actually damages the DNA so they were actually um, uh, causing themselves damage not only this generation and to themselves but for future generations down the line Wow well Dennis I think I covered everything one thing I've learned here is you're selling an awful lot of trade goods to women, <laughs> and not just muskets and tomahawks and gunpowder. Well, if you're going to, you know, what they say is happy wife, happy life, and nobody knew that better than most Native Americans. You know? All right, uh, any final words before we say goodbye? No, I hope people get a chance to stop out and see it, and of course this isn't the final word in uh, trade goods or anything else. We change and adapt as more information becomes available, and as history unfolds, you have to take and change your presentation and how you do things in order to tell the story of that history. All right. Well, thank you, Dennis, for uh, showing me everything, and uh, I'll get another video of an, at another site with you. All right. Thank you very much, Bill. All right. And be kind and be courteous out there in the world.